today we are talking about the national research data infrastructure. But maybe first of all, let me have a quick glimpse in what times are we living? Of course, we have tough times, right? Having a conference like this being an exception already says a lot. Now, in these times, it becomes, from my perspective, even more important that we look ahead so that in maybe 10 or 15 or 20 years from now, we can look back and say, we did some things right. Maybe not everything, but some things we did right. And I think the preservation of digital data in our age is something we have to do right. There we don't have much choice. We need, we need to make choices and hopefully we are going to make the right choices. And in fact, this has been a conclusion which has been drawn a couple of years ago in research in Germany. So over a decade ago, over 10 years ago, though, some people started discussing how can we improve access to research data in Germany. It was called the Council for Research uh, for, for Information, uh, RFI, Rat für Information Infrastrukturen, the Council for Information Infrastructures. And they started this discussion around 2010, 2012, uh, and they came to the conclusion, we need to do something big. Uh, and actually then they proposed something with a paper, and there you can see the power of paper, because this paper ended up in a significant funding. And what I'm going to present here as of today is a sustainable, quite sustained funding for about 10 years, where some people say it's, it's about 900 million euros. It's at least in the area of 900 million euros, uh, which is being spread across a lot of different research organizations in Germany. So it's quite an endeavor. And I think in times like these, uh, it becomes even more uh, important that we, that we become actionable. Of course, we have a long-term plan. We want to establish fair data over decades. However, seeing what is going on, like the war in Ukraine, where not only the, um, yeah, the infrastructure at hand is being destroyed by the war, but also the digital infrastructure is being destroyed by war. There we see that some servers are just breaking apart and they include cultural service, research service, whatever is on there is being just destroyed, sometimes without copies, sometimes without long-term preservation. So web archiving is, a, is becoming a crucial topic in these times. And then if you see like pandemic structures, where we start to think, how can mobility data help to fight pandemies? And suddenly we reuse data in different contexts, which we haven't thought about before and becomes useful. And now in these times, we are going to start an endeavor called National Research Data Infrastructure. My first day in office, Martin, was the 1st of March 2020. It was two days before lockdown started in Germany. So I came to the office. I met my first two employees. We had a good time. We, we had two weeks together. And then on a Friday evening, I, uh, Friday, Friday afternoon, I remember quite well, we looked into each other's and said, Let's see how next week is going to proceed. Please take home your mouse, your keyboard, your laptop, and next week we will see. The rest is history. We started working uh, digitally, virtually, and the whole network of NFDI was born into this situation. So what I'm presenting here as now is the collaboration of people who hardly met over the past two years. And I think this is quite impressive if you see what can be achieved with these means. Having said that, we are all a bit tired of these virtual organization stuff. Uh, so meeting in person, drinking a coffee, having a good conversation, having a nice evening out, having a nice dinner is something we urgently need back. And at the same time, we discuss, well, there are some benefits from the digital collaboration. It, we can be inclusive. People from other countries, welcome to uh, United States, Australia, whatever, wherever you're coming from and visiting this research. You can participate. Of course, time zones hinder a bit. But the future, what will it be? It will probably both of it. So we will have meetings again. We will have virtual collaboration. And if I interpret human mankind correctly, then we will make the horror scenario out of that, that we have to go to, uh, to physical presence as before, and we have to attend virtual meetings as before. So we rush from virtual meeting to presence meeting to virtual meeting to presence meeting. This is how human mankind usually is uh, going to exaggerate everything. But probably we will come up with clever strategies how to deal with that. And I'm confident we will make the best out of it. So, welcome to my today's talk on the National Research Data Infrastructure. I'm going to give you a little highlight, a motivation. Why is this interesting? 
Why is this important? I will show you the structure of NFDI. I will highlight the work of my colleagues because it's not me. I'm just presenting here, but it's a network that consists of hundreds of people that are collaborating jointly. So I kindly invite you to take part in this little journey as of today. And as I've learned, we have a meet the expert session afterwards. So I'm, I will be there to answer all your questions in a nice, ho hopefully nice, so hopefully answer all your questions in a nice atmosphere. So let's start the presentation here. And I would like to start uh, with a picture which comes from uh, Botticelli. It's the birth of Jesus Christ. Wow, why the heck is he starting with a picture from the birth of Jesus Christ when he talks about the national research data infrastructure? Well, as the story goes, uh, what was performed at that point of time? Well, they had a census. And a census is a means to look into the society. It has been conducted even before that, so it wasn't the first census to be conducted. However, it is one which is remembered by many people because of the story around the birth of Jesus Christ. And of course, the reason for doing census uh, at that point of time was a military reason. It was about paying taxes and using that money for military reasons. Now, if we look into today, we still do these census. And I here have a picture from the census in 2011. It's, it's a credit also to my Gezes colleagues, uh, because some of the Gezes colleagues were heavily involved in calculating the statistical details for this census. And in 2011, um, the census just, it just went on. It was like business as normal. Well, if some people maybe remember the German census before 2011, that was in 1987, I think, it was rebellion. It was fire on the street. People were protesting against the census. It was on the media. Uh, there were protests um, going on for weeks. So it was a big issue. And what, what was different from 87 to 2011. Well, of course, time evolved. Maybe people calmed down a bit. Uh, but also the collection method has been changed. And one of the clever things was to have a statistical model. So you only had to ask a certain amount of the people. Um, and then you could deduct from that how actually the society looks into that. And it's a well-known means, of course, in social sciences. This is how large-scale studies are being conducted nowadays. And it's thanks to statistical methods and thanks to computer infrastructure that we are able to do it. And maybe you haven't noticed, but in 2022, we again had a census in Germany. And a lot of people didn't realize that this is going on. Well, those of you who received a letter maybe said, oh, I have to fill in all these details. What a nightmare. But I can't see any protest anywhere. So we, we, we moved along the lines. And what, why is this so interesting? Because it gives us an insight into the society. And it, this is what, one thing where data is really crucial for the development of our society. I have another example. And this is the glance into the distance, you could say. Here I brought you a picture of the telescope, which has been invented in 1608. And those two telescopes, uh, telescopes have been used by Galileo Galilei, and they have been um, yeah, used for proving hypotheses, for example. So he asked certain hypotheses, and he tried to prove the hypotheses by using these telescopes. And there are nice stories around the telescopes, so it's really worthwhile to read this story. Um, who invented the telescopes, who used the telescopes, who actually got the data out of these telescopes and who, who could reuse the data. It wasn't a time where data sharing was uh, favorable, let's say it like this. So there was a dispute about who gets the data and what can be done with that. It's a long story. If you look nowadays, we have, of course, um, infrastructures like the Hubble Space Telescope, which is, uh, which is in production since the 1990s. It had some technical problems in between, <laughs> as you might know, but it, uh, but it provided us with pictures from very far distances. And it allowed us to, to look into the future in ways we couldn't do before. And what you see here is a major step in between in technology development, of course. It's easy to see, right? But it also shows what research today is. We have infrastructure that is designed to produce data. So the, the whole purpose of the Hubble Space Telescope is to collect data in a professional way 
and to allow access to the data for research communities around the world. And this is what drives our research nowadays. We have huge infrastructures providing data. Not exclusively, not in all domains, but in many cases we have these research data infrastructures. To give you another example, this is the glance into the inner, into the small things, into the inside. And it's an example which comes from my youth, you could say. Uh, maybe you also learned about it in chemistry uh, during your school times. It's the Rutherford'sche Streuversuch in German, or the Rutherford scattering. So what Rutherford did was, he, used atom, he, he shot atoms through a very thin line of, of gold atoms. And now what he expected was that the atoms are being blocked. Now something very interesting happened. A lot of the atom or particles, sorry, particles, not atoms, but particles, a lot of the particles just crossed the, the gold, uh, the thin gold line without being blocked. And some of the particles were spread into, into different areas. Now, why is that interesting? Because it revolutionized the view on what matter is in its smallest things. For us, it's, it's, it's the accepted worldview. At that point of time, people thought this is a concrete desk, you can't pass through. But small particles can pass through. And it's due to the effect that mat material, in the very inner things, it's atoms and electrons and neutrons, and it's 99% nothing. And so, of course, other, per other particles can pass through nothing. And it, it, it was really a dramatic shift in the world view on nature actually is. And Rutherford and his team collected the data. They had an hypothesis and they proved the hypothesis uh, with this little experiment. Nowadays, of course, we have bigger machinery and the equivalent here is probably the Large Hadron Collider, the L LHC, uh, running since 2008. Some people say it's the biggest, largest machine that human mankind ever built. What is the biggest? The web or the internet, I would say. Uh, but of course, we can argue about this view. Now, what happens here is, to a certain degree, a similar experiment, but with much higher energy. And what you want to do is a similar thing. You want to have a better view on the even smaller things. So they were looking for the hadron, the hadrons, um, and, and very small particles. It costs a huge amount of money, and it and it showed us new details from the very inner uh, nature sciences. And again, it's a research data infrastructure. And behind this, this ring, where they accelerate small particles, there's a whole global infrastructure, because they produce petabytes of data with the experiments. They have thousands of experiments running every day. And, they, and the data is being processed here, then separated and distributed into a globally connected a uh, network of research data centers, the tier zero, tier one, and uh, tier, tier two, I guess, um, uh, networks. And maybe you're working for an institution which is hosting one of those nodes. And then there's a whole research community from physicists who are using these data to understand better nature sciences. Again, it's a huge community behind the infrastructure. So those were my introducing three examples from society, from uh, yeah, from astronomy and from chemistry. Maybe you want to relax and sit back and think about your own scientific domain. What is your scientific domain? And what are the research data infrastructures that are in place as of today? Probably most of you will easily come up with examples for such infrastructures as well. So let's take this as a starting point. Now here comes an observation. Uh, which I had when I read the, the infamous uh, FAIR Principles paper. So you probably know, all know about the FAIR Principles to make data findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. If you don't, if you don't know, read this paper, please. Um, it has many citations. And when, after reading the article, I thought, well, this is interesting. Because more, and this, this is my finding, more and more research results are achieved by using already existing research data. I wasn't the first person to realize that. And it sounds so intuitive. It sounds so straightforward. So why the heck is this guy, director of NFDI, now saying this is so important? Well, look into the past centuries. Look into how research was done 300, 400 years ago. 
when researchers like Humboldt, for example, or Marie Curie, um, when, when they did their research, what actually happened was they first produced data, or Humboldt traveled the world and collected objects as data, and then afterwards he, he himself was doing research with that. And then in some areas it started that also other researchers got access to the objects or to the data and could do some research. And nowadays it's vice versa. Data are being produced in large quantities by large infrastructures and whole communities are working with these data. Now you could say, okay, everything's in place. Where's the job to do? What's the problem? Well, frankly spoken, this is how I experienced research when I was a young researcher, but that is a long time ago, some gray hair. But when I was a young researcher, it was, there was no gold standard in my area. I did information retrieval, I did semantic web stuff. Um, it was the beginning of cr the creation of data sets for computer science, for example. So it was really hard to have data. We, we created synthetic data sets and we didn't even understand what the problems of these data sets were. We just created them and we just used them. Now, years later, I say, this was a starting point of a discussion. What kind of data do we need? And what kind of data can, can we use to have solid experiments to base our research on? Now, the problem is that even nowadays, even 2022, in many areas, significant er uh, efforts are still required to find the right data set, to understand it, and to use it for the purpose at hand. So despite the fact that we have infrastructures, and we have many, it's still not the case that you can easily find the research data that you need at hand to reuse it uh, and, and maybe to combine it with other research data. It's getting better and better, but there's still huge potential. And this was the starting point for actually the work in NFDI. What we want to achieve now with NFDI is a picture which I brought you here. The idea is to stand on the shoulders of giants. Why is that so cool to stand on the shoulders, shoulders of giants? Maybe you remember as a young child to sit on the shoulders of your parents, for example. What happens there? Well, you have a better angle, right? You are sitting higher, so you can see further. And if you also know that we are living on a bowel, it's not a flat earth, it's a bowel. So then if the angle becomes higher, you can see further beyond the horizon. Of course, if you sit on my shoulders, you can't see much further, but if it's a giant, okay, well, you can see beyond the horizon. So the picture here is you can see further than other people that, that don't stand on the shoulders of giants. And actually, this is a principle which in research is common. It's called state of the art. So the giants are the state of the art and all new generations of researchers are building on the, they, they are standing on the shoulders of the state of the art. And what we want to achieve is that the same principle holds for research data. Please make all research data available so that future generations of researchers can reuse it for the purpose at hand. And they will have a purpose which we do not foresee. They will have yet another challenge to solve for human mankind. And we are maybe producing nowadays the data that in 5, 10, 20, maybe even 100 years from now are important to solve the next challenge. So therefore, we better take care on the curation and on the provision of access to such research data. Still, we have many projects that are producing data. And it, it, it now begins that, for example, the German research funders, the DFG, they require you to have a data management plan. This has become now more common and now it's even mandatory. But this is a quite new regulation. It's, it's not so long ago that a lot of data, they, they just were stored somewhere and never anyone could reuse it. And you probably know examples by yourself. And we want to change that. Our vision is that research data sets are fair. And fair is, of course, according to the fair principles. And now I add three little words. And by adding these three little words, we have a huge room for discussions and solutions. It's the three words for all and forever. Now, why is that so big? Let me make my uh, asterisk is here. So first one is findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Now for all, why is that so difficult? We had a panel um, this, today 
uh, as one of the NFDI workshops where we discussed fair versus open. And actually not all fair data are open data and not all open data are fair data. But there is a fraction of data which is fair and open. And there's a fraction of data which is neither fair nor open. Of course, so we have everything. And we have to find the right balance here. If you have, for example, GDPR regulated data, person sensitive data uh, related data, like in the social sciences, you cannot simply put it on a website and say, here's the data, do whatever you want with it. You have to have access means like a safe, like, like a safe data center where you have a structured process where you can work with the data with anonymization uh, and, and other means and other methods. And now more and more research areas are having personal sensitive data. It's, it's not just the social sciences any longer. Why is that the case? Because we combine all kinds of different data sets. Suddenly we have mobile mobility data from people who are moving around somewhere. If we want to reuse the data, we better make sure that GDPR rules are being, uh, being um, obeyed. obeyed. Um, right. So for all, basically means we have target groups and we address target groups of researchers because some people are eligible to work with data and they have a special process to work with these data. And now what we aim for in NFDI is to have an exchange of experiences, for example, from the social sciences to other research domains so that they learn how you can provide access to GDPR regulated data. And another example is coming from uh, nature sciences where you have huge quantities of data, like in astronomy, it's exabytes of data, and they know how to deal easily with these amounts of data. And in other sciences now, th where they are starting to become data intensive, they of course benefit from this experience how to work with large scale data. And NFDI is the place where we bring together all these communities in one place to find the next big solution, you could say. Actually, it's a number of small solutions. It's not the one, but uh, it's a number of small solutions. Now, the next word, forever, it's just one word, but it's so difficult to, to solve. Um, you probably also talked about long-term preservation. It's an unresolved issue for digital artifacts. Uh, we have some ways, like the LOX principle, we have means of archiving, but no one so far has, has, a, has a digital storage where you can preserve your digital data forever. One of the best strategies is to buy a new, new hard disk every three years and just to copy the data onto the new disk and keep the old one just in case. Is this a good strategy? I'm not so sure about it. Uh, so there's lots of room for discussion. And here's the story. Um, here's a quote from, my, from a book from my youth. It's of course Alice in Wonderland. And Alice asks, how long is forever? And the white rabbit answers, sometimes it's just one second. And here's the, the room for discussion. Do we keep all data? And astronomy is an example where you don't keep all the raw data. You collect the data and you, you, make, uh, you strip it down because it's just economically not feasible to keep all the raw data. CERN is another example where you have abstractions and where you compress data, for example. So we, we need to answer this forever question from, from the angle, what do we actually need to store? And what do we need in future to answer research questions? And we put this together in NFTI. We, we bring all people together for all and forever and make, make it fair. Ah, here, yeah, sorry. <laughs> so we come to the foundation. NFTI is an association, um, but in fact, it's two streams that, that are now being mixed together more and more. Because on the one hand, we have an association where I'm the director and we have a staff of 15 people working uh, at the NFDI head office. On the other hand, and this is where most of the money goes, we have so-called NFDI consortia. And today, uh, many of these consortia are being represented in some of the workshops. It's, for example, NFDI for culture, NFDI for chem, NFDI for inch, and so on and so forth. And here the idea is that you have whole communities that are being represented. And the first, of these, the first nine of these consortia started in 2020. At the same time, we founded here in October 12, uh, 2020, uh, actually the, the, uh, the association Ein Verein nach deutschem Recht, Eingetragener Verein. Thanks to TIP Hannover, by the way, for hosting this event uh, on a shorthand notice. We wanted to do it in Berlin, but Corona said, no, don't go to Berlin. Uh, so we said, okay, we go to Hannover, no problem. Thanks, Sören. Uh, 
Um, what you see here is, and this is why I brought you this picture, it's the German state and all 16 states. So our funding is coming from the German ministry and from the federal states. And this is why we have a sustained funding for 10 years and we all hope to sustain it afterwards. By 2021, we became legally independent. We are now employing all our stuff by ourselves. And frankly spoken, this was a steep learning curve because we had to implement all processes from scratch. Hire people, social security, blah, 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 everything. And to tell you the truth, it's a lot of fun to create a completely new organization. Uh, it's a mixture of different tasks, but my team is really happy um, and energetic uh, to really start up this endeavor. Luckily, uh, from the very, not from the very start, but very soon afterwards, Eva Lübke joined, who you see here. She's the administrative director of NFDI, and we both co-lead the association. Then in 2021, 10 further consortia started and so-called four sections. And I'm coming back to that a little bit later. At the end of 2021, all the bodies or organs of the association have been staffed. So we now have a scientific senate, we have a board, uh, we have a members, a members assembly, we have a consortia assembly, and we have the directorate. So you could say by the end of 21, we were fully operational. Um, and, and so speed is now increasing. And then something magic happened. <laughs> because the DFG opened up the, on a very short notice in January, opened up a call for, infrast for infrastructure, so-called Basisdienst or base services. And you see here the date of the submission of the proposal. And if I tell you some numbers from the proposal, so I'm always ehrfürchtig. Um, so the, 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 the call opened in January. And by the end of April, a consortium which consisted of all 19 consortia. So all 19 consortia are being represented in this one uh, proposal. And they submitted this and said, we have an idea how we can uh, improve the infrastructure services in Germany for research in total. It's still in the evaluation, so I cannot say much further here. But uh, at the end of the year, we, we will know more how successful this proposal can go. And then in January 2023, the final run, round of consortia hopefully can start uh, because we are also now in the final selection round. So you see here the nine plus 10. In fact, it can be up to 30 consortia. So up to 11 consortia, including the basic service proposal can be funded uh, this year and can start hopefully in January 2023. Now, what is the purpose of the association? Our purpose is to guide and coordinate the creation of a networked information infrastructure. So it's, it's not a monolithic thing, but it's rather a network. It's, it consists of data archives, uh, Rechenzentren, uh, uh, um, computing centers, it's research bodies, it's all kinds of different organizations. And they all agree on standards like metadata standards, and they all agree how to collaborate to solve the task. What we want to establish are processes and procedures for standardized RDM, for standardized research data management, to make data fair. So we want to agree how to, how to archive data in culture sciences, how to archive and access data in chemistry, and so on and so forth. And we want to benefit from the experience from the different uh, communities. We want to develop interdisciplinary metadata standards. And one of the sessions today was about the Open Research Knowledge Graph, the ORKG. And this is one of the integration points where many things come together. And you could say this is one of the first interdisciplinary metadata standards uh, that also has a re strong relation to NFDI. Actually, it has been started before NFDI, and we benefit now from having this as a first, um, uh, as a first big knowledge graph. Of course, we also want to link to European and inter international platforms. Uh, we have an N, like a national research data infrastructure, but research is international, of course. I will come to that on, a, on another slide. And then, frankly spoken, uh, the point E is where I'm still thinking hardly what exactly does this mean in the operational work. We want to create a shared base for protection, sovereignty, integrity, security, and quality of data. Do everything what you need to do is basically the message. And of course, we have to, yeah, we have to address this step by step in the network. So this is where, where we are on a starting point, frankly spoken. We have five bodies. 
uh, scientific senate, board of trustees, consortia assembly, directorate and members assembly. And here I brought you a little overview of where we are. The scientific se uh, senate is 13 members and those are persons and I'm as the director am heading the scientific senate. This is the strategic, um, the strategic body you could say. Then we have the board of trustees and there we have the German ministries represented but also some researchers. And this is the, you could say, the financial governance body. And it's the link to the German Ministry of Research and Education. In the consortia assembly, the consortia come together. Currently it's 19 people who are coming here together. So it's the content, uh, it's the operational organ, you could say. Here the big discussions are being done. What do we, what do, we do as a network? will be up to 30. Plus we have so-called four sections, which are, uh, which are kind of a matrix structure. So every section spans across multiple consortia, maybe sometimes even all consortia. The directorate is what I am heading uh, together with Eva Lübke. And we have the, like the 15 people in total in the directorate. And the members assembly is what every association in Germany has. And here we have at the moment, oh, it's 216 <laughs> as of now members um, and a member can be something like a university, like University of Cologne is a member, for example, RWTH Aachen is a member, for example, uh, Helmholtz Center, Helmholtz Center Jülich is a, is a member, for example, Fraun, Fraunhofer Institute Focus is a member, for example, Leibniz Institute Gesis uh, is, is a member, for example, and what I, for Max Planck, uh, uh, Max, the Max Planck Society, oh, we still have to work on that a little bit because it's the society as a whole. Uh, but also Fraunhofer uh, as a whole is a member. So what we have here is 216 members from Germany who are already organized within the association. And this is really cross-cutting the German landscape. If you put these members on, on a German map, you see that uh, Germany is nicely covered with all, with all federal states. Some are more dense than others, of course, but also it's spanning across all different alliance members. So for the Germans uh, here, so the Allianzmitglieder, Universitäten und Außeruniversitäre Forschungseinrichtungen, they all are re represented here. So we bring together research in Germany. And to give you a, a little bit an idea of what these consortia are, I brought you the names here. And from the name, you can often guess what this consortium is about. Data plant, uh, GHGA, Consort SVD, Biodiversity, CAT, no, it's not CATS, it's Catalysis <laughs> from chemistry, chemistry, and CAT and CHEM, actually those are uh, prototypical because uh, NFDI for CAT, you could say it's a deep dive into catalysis. And NFDI for CHEM is covering chemistry in total. So it's like a T-shaped profile. We go into breadth and we go into depth uh, with the consortia. This somehow miraculously came out of the application and evaluation process, but we have this in many areas. For example, NFDI for health is uh, life sciences and health topics in, in broad and um, microbiota, NFDI for microbiota, this is again a deep dive here. So we often have combining uh, consortia, but this is not the case everywhere. It's round two out of three and in the uh, right now we have about 200 co-applicants in this network i'm in contact with almost 250 co-spokespersons people in the network and there are about 400 further participants who are organized as of now and to make it a little bit more concrete i have three uh, selected examples so nfdi for health is the national national research data infrastructure for personal health data and the goal is a co comprehensive inventory of German epidemiological public health and clinical study data to bring together these various bits and pieces. And the, the challenge here, of course, is GDPR issues and personal, yeah, the sensitive nature of personal health data. Then with NFDI for Earth, uh, we have a consortium which addresses the global scale, you could say. It's the Earth System Sciences. And here uh, the problem is a little bit the national and the international linkages between a lot of subdisciplines. It's a quite fragmented community. And this consortium has as a goal to bring together these bits and pieces and make it more coherent. Last but not least, punch for NFDI. It's particles, universe, nuclear and hadrons for the NFDI. And here they want to establish a fair science data platform. And they have an interesting aspect here because they have a certain irreversibility of the data generated. What does it mean? You make an observation of the universe 
you cannot repeat this experiment because the universe is in this exact state only at this point of time when you do the experiment. And this, of course, has a certain influence on how to keep data, how to store data, and what to do uh, with the data. Also, to yeah, yeah, all kinds of questions are related to that. And this gives you some idea of the communities. Now, I talked about these sections, which span across different consortia. This is the, the matrix structure. And it all started with 12 topics, which were identified by so-called cross-cutting topics. And it was a group of people, they were very engaged, and even before we started uh, at the directorate, they wrote a paper. And they said, the Berlin-Leipzig uh, Declaration, and they said, we have a number of topics where we believe that NFDI has to address it. And I brought you um, the most important ones. It's 12 topics which we identified. And if you read through it, you think, yeah, yeah, sounds like cross-cutting topics. What we did then was we, ident uh, we, we talked with the consortia and we, we asked them the question, which of these topics are most relevant to do? So please prioritize, because we cannot do all the 12 topics from the very beginning. Please make it an ordered list, first of all. And second, I asked, who is willing to lead a topic? Because only if I have network partners who are willing to lead for a topic, and at the same time, it has a high priority for a lot of partners, then it makes sense for starting. And then very easily, we identified four topics, which then became the first four sections. And probably it's quite intuitive, the topics, frankly spoken, uh, but it was very, wor very worthwhile to, uh, to, do the, to do the work and to come up with these four sections. Now, the first three sections, th they were really like this. Um, all or almost all consortia said it's of high importance to us. And I had at least two organizations who said we are willing to lead the topic. Easy. The fourth topic, ethical and legal aspects in general and person related, that, had, that was kind of special. There, roughly half of the consortia said it's, it's important to us. But at the same time, those uh, half of the consortia said, without it, we, we, we do not need to start the work. So only if we solve the problems here, it makes sense what we are going to do. And therefore, we said, OK, as an extra rule, if we have a, a decent amount of consortia, let's say half, half of all consortia, and at the same time, it is an overproportionally highly important topic, then it also uh, may become a section. And, and so this is actually how the four, four sections have been installed. Um, there is a certain process behind, uh, but most importantly, I would like to point you here to the Zenodo community site of NFDI, where you can find all the section concepts uh, as um, open access documents. So if you are interested, you can read through it. In fact, um, oh, Sorry. In fact, we just repeated this experiment, or, or, or this, not experiment, we repeated uh, this task, and we identified a potential fifth topic for a section, uh, and that is industry collaboration, because a lot of, uh, a lot of, um, there's roughly half of the consortia saying, this is really important to us, and they say it's overly important to us. So without collaboration with industry, it doesn't make, make a lot of sense what we are doing. So maybe as of next year, we will have a fifth uh, section, which is about industry relationship. Now, one of the first results is this basic services uh, proposal, which I said. This was really something special, because the funding in the third round wasn't meant to uh, be spent for basic services. What is the objective? It's basic services as a common concern of all consortia. So it's only services who are really important for all these 19, respectively 30 consortia. Now think about a common service which is needed by all researchers in German. My first ideas was authentication and authorization. I want to use my home account to use all the nice data services in future. I don't want to have 20,000 accounts as I have now. And the second one was PIDs, because all, if you want to make research data fair, then they need to be identified properly. And then the discussion was open and we had a qualified list of uh, potential further candidates. And in fact, um, what happened then was a huge discussion inside the network. And they asked this very in a structured manner. What kind of services are important to you as community? And then the communities answered. And from that, 
in fact, those two and a terminology service at the third one, those are the first three candidates for common services that are relevant to all the consortia. Last but not least, because we're almost through, um, I motivated the international language. And here the European Open Science Cloud is of course of high importance for us people here in Europe. And if you are not familiar with it, it's neither European, it's neither open, it's neither about science, and it's, and it, it's also not about cloud. It's not a quote from me, but uh, my colleague Klaus Tochtermann said it at one point of time, and I think there's some truth in it. However, it stands for a European infrastructure which aims to provide, well, some cloud-based infrastructure for, for research. But not just for research, it's also industry a little bit, so it's, it's kind of a mixed picture. Um, it started in December 2021, so in parallel to NFDI, they are starting now the structure there. It's, a, um, it's not a German association, it's, a, it's kind of an association according to Belgian law, it's an AISBL which is quite similar to a German association. Uh, this, they have now 10 people hired or something, and they also begin to roll out activities. And there, all the, German, uh, all the European countries are represented. In Germany, we have a kind of a pole position because of the NFDI funding. Um, so there we are, in comparison to, other, to, to most other countries, we, ha we have much more significant uh, funding, which you can dedicate towards EOSC. But this is improving in many countries, so they are fastly pacing uh, into the same direction. We as NFDI are the mandated member for Germany, which means the German ministry, BMBF, told us you have to organize the German contribution uh, in EOSC. And this is what we do right now. So we have a, an EOSC roundtable, for example, where we bring together the German participants. Also an initiative is Gaia-X, and this is an industry-driven initiative. It started German, but it became very soon European and even international. And it's mainly driven by industry. So you could say this is the first start of this industry collaboration, which we have here. It's about data sovereignty of companies. So Gaia-X aims to provide a technical infrastructure where, where the lock-in effect of using certain cloud, uh, facility, cloud storages is being reduced. So essentially, if a company nowadays uses, um, let's say, the cloud storage A, and it wants to use the cloud storage B, then uh, hopefully in future, due to the Gaia-X technology, it is much easier to, to switch uh, the cloud storage in behind. So it's a multi-cloud scenario. However, from my perspective, uh, the technical architectures may be interesting also for research purposes. So maybe we can reuse this technology. I'm not yet sure about it, but we, we have to find out this. It's a huge endeavor. Also, on the other hand, we have something to offer because we are the experts for making data fair. And industry actually has a lot of interoperability issues. Uh, and this is where I think maybe we have a fruitful collaboration so we can come up uh, with a clever solution that helps both both sides. Therefore, we acquired a third-party funded project, which is called Fair Data Spaces. What a genius creation, right? Because Data Spaces is the technology behind Gaia-X. It started on May 17th in 2021. And as activities, we have joint road mapping, community building, but we also have dedicated technical, legal and ethical tasks and work packages. And, map, and by that, we try to interlink these two large, huge scale initiatives. So hopefully, yeah, in, in the near future, we have some the first concrete results. We are actually looking forward uh, to the first reports and also prototypes, and we can demonstrate how uh, industry and research can go together a bit better than before. This brings me to the end of my presentation. I hope I gave you some overview of why is NFDI interesting, why is it happen right now, and where are we at the moment. And to make a long story short, we are a huge network and collaboration is at our core. So please also see this presentation maybe as a starting point of a collaboration between you and NFDI. If you say you see a potential there, you may even contact me personally. I'm very happy to talk to you about it. Maybe you are also already participating in some of the consortia, then we will meet anyway in one of the future meetings. Thank you very much for coming here. Thank you very much for the virtual audience, for staying with us. And I'm really looking forward to your questions now. Thank you.